First, let's talk about counseling about tinnitus. Very important. You cannot really manage a person who has tinnitus without really educating a person about what their tinnitus means and what kinds of things they can do to help learn to live with it. So for most clients, we need to discuss at a minimum the following topics. We need to talk about the incidence of tinnitus because patients and clients need to know how they might be affected and that they're not alone and that tinnitus really is a very common symptom. We need to talk about the auditory system and the possible causes of tinnitus. There are, as I will say, thousands of things that can cause tinnitus and clients, patients need to understand that the tinnitus that they are experiencing is not being caused by something that's dangerous to them or that may have some terrible effects in their long-term future. We need to talk about why hearing loss can cause tinnitus. Very important because we're going to be talking to our clients about hearing aids and so they need to understand how the the two, uh, the hearing loss and the presence of tinnitus really tie together and why they're related to each other. We also need to talk about the fact that we understand the common difficulties that are created by tinnitus. When we are able to convey to our clients our understanding about what they're experiencing, it will build confidence in them that we can relate to the effects that they're having, which some of the people around them, their friends and relatives, may really not be able to relate to because they really don't have the understanding. We want to talk to our clients very importantly about the importance of getting a very thorough medical and physical evaluation, preferably by a specialist in ear, nose, and throat. And the reason for this is we need to make certain, first of all, that we're guarding ourselves and not providing treatment to somebody who should have been getting treatment from a physician. We don't want to be uh, hiding or masking a serious medical problem. And we also want to be able to find out what the, that there are no serious consequences of the tinnitus for the patient's own security. Patients need to be reassured that the fact that they're experiencing this annoying symptom does not mean that they have some horrible disease that's going to kill them or is going to make them deaf or similar situations. And then we want to make certain that our clients can understand that their brain is capable of suppressing this phantom this phantom perception and really can suppress many phantom perceptions such as amputated legs or phantom limb syndrome tinnitus is going to be a similar problem and their brains do have the capacity to suppress these symptoms so we're going to talk about things we could say to our our clients in order for them to best understand it so let's talk about some facts that we know about tinnitus. First of all, we know that tinnitus is very common. 15 to 20 percent of the general population have tinnitus, and interestingly, 70 to 85 percent of hearing impaired individuals experience tinnitus either on a constant or on an intermittent or sometimes on an occasional basis. The majority of people who have tinnitus fortunately report it as nothing more than a minor annoyance as opposed to a major problem. It's the individuals who report this as a major problem that we really have to focus our therapeutic intervention on. Providing information to your clients that have tinnitus is going to be something that's going to be highly gratified by the patient. The patients are going to be very happy that you have taken the time to explain what's going on in their head about their tinnitus because it's something that they may have had no knowledge about and may have not received any information about from other medical professionals. So I now want to bring up some of the facts also that we know about tinnitus. First of all, the most common difficulties that a person experiences when they have tinnitus typically relate to getting to sleep, and this is not something that we can minimize. This is a very important problem. When a client can't sleep well, they're going to have difficulty co coping with this problem. We also know that it's the persistence of tinnitus 
and as I will say later, rather than the loudness that creates such a problem for patients. Um, the fact that it's always there, the fact that it's, they get, it's unrelenting, they get no rest from it, is very annoying. For many people who have tinnitus, it's a matter of concentration. The presence of this background signal, no matter how loud or how soft, interferes with their concentration. And this becomes a, a major intrusiveness or annoying factor for, for many of our clients. What this does ultimately is it induces fear. When we don't know, when we as human beings don't know the cause of something and we don't know the consequence of something that may be dangerous, it's going to induce fear. And as I will point out to you, it's this fear that really creates the persistence of attention that's paid to the tinnitus. So one of our jobs as professionals is going to be help, is help the patients get relief from the fear that goes along from uh, noticing tinnitus. The, there's a number of things that can cause tinnitus, literally thousands of different factors that can cause tinnitus. Oftentimes we don't know what the cause is, but we do know that we could divide tinnitus up into two major categories, subjective and objective. Subjective tinnitus means that it's something that only the person experiencing it can hear. Objective tinnitus means that literally a person standing next to them or you as a professional holding a stethoscope to their ear can hear. Objective tinnitus is something that requires a physician's appraisal immediately. So if the person reports having a pulsating tinnitus or reports having a tinnitus that's clicking, for example, that's something you want to get the patient to the physician right away because they are able to find out if it's something that's vascular or muscular related that might be able to be cured or in a even more important scenario that might be related to a medical disorder that needs to be identified and treated. So really, where is this perception coming from? Well, this is a slide that uh, you don't have to know every single word on. It's a kind of a technical slide. But really, what it points out are some of the major things that can cause tinnitus. So I'm just going to briefly take you through these five bullets. The first and most common cause of tinnitus is that it's related to a lack of stimulation from the peripheral system. So in other words, the cochlea is damaged, the inner ear is damaged, there's a hearing loss, perhaps in the high frequencies, perhaps in the low frequencies, but whatever it, wherever it's coming from, the, nerves, the neurons in the brain that are associated with those nerves in the ear those nerves in the brain are still functioning properly. It's the nerves in the ear that are not sending up the proper signal. And the brain always wants to receive a signal that it expects to receive. And the fact of the matter is, is that our brain is designed to always receive incoming sound. You know, we could close our eyes and cut out incoming visual stimulation, but we don't have ear lids. We can't close our ears to shut out incoming auditory stimulation. So the brain always expects to receive auditory stimulation, and when it doesn't, it literally turns up its sensitivity, it turns up its internal gain to try to compensate for what it's not receiving from the ear. Another problem that we have is that when we have damage to our outer hair cells, when we have inner ear damage, in other words, it changes the inhibitory function that these outer hair cells provide. So it doesn't allow us to suppress certain outside stimuli and we believe certain internal stimuli like tinnitus. There's also, as we'll get into in great detail in this next 45 minutes or so, We'll get into great detail about the fact that the limbic system, the emotional control center of the brain, is not processing properly when it focuses on the tinnitus. And we're going to talk about how we can help our clients learn how to control that problem. This problem is almost always related to fear or threat. If a patient or a client interprets the tinnitus perception as being something that is threatening to their well-being, it induces fear, that triggers the limbic system, and that is going to create a vicious cycle that we need to try to help our clients break. And then I just want to mention, although we're not going to dwell on it, the fact that 
Other things that are not even related to the ear can also cause tinnitus. People who grind their teeth at night, people who have neck problems. This can cause tinnitus because it can send a signal to the auditory cortex where sound is perceived. There's a number of things that can trigger tinnitus, and it helps the patient or the client when we talk to them about some of these potential triggers. Among the more common triggers are physical problems such as certain kinds of medication, a virus that they might have caught, some kind of a, a, an imbalance between the, um, the uh, inner hair cells and the outer hair cells or the excitatory or the inhibitory neurons, um, and as I mentioned, some other sensory influences like problems in the neck or in the, in the um, in the jaw. There's also psychological triggers. A person who is worried about their spouse or their significant other having uh, a medical problem or an illness, worrying about your job, worrying about money, these kinds of psychological triggers can really induce the perception of tinnitus. Retirement syndrome is something I refer to as individuals who have been very busy all their life, who have had their minds very much engaged, that now are finding that once they've retired, they have an awful lot of time on their hand, they have an lo awful lot of quiet environments, and that makes them think about their tinnitus more frequently. And as we'll talk about, one of the most common triggers for tinnitus is stress, and, and we'll get into this in great detail. So let's also mention some of the factors that can exacerbate or increase the tinnitus. They don't necessarily cause it, but they clearly can increase it. You can see on the screen caffeine, alcohol, smoking, which is not good for anybody, sodium, which is not good for people who have situations like Meniere's disease or something like that. Um, other medical disorders, high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia, thyroid issues can be things that will increase a person's perception of their tinnitus. The two most common exacerbating factors, however, are going to be high noise exposure and stress. So what we're going to be talking about now as we get into the other steps are the basic assumptions that we can call upon to help our patient learn to cope with the tinnitus. The first assumption is that the brain is capable of sorting out meaningful stimuli from those that are not meaningful. The second is that attention is going to be directed towards features that are salient or attention-bearing, and if the, per, if the person who has tinnitus perceives the tinnitus as meaning something important, usually something negative, then their attention is going to be drawn to it. So we're going to be talking to our patients about how the brain habituates or becomes accustomed to or acclimates to other stimuli. Very simple examples that you'll see in our counseling video refer to situations like having a ring on your finger, having clothing on. We don't sit and, and think about the clothing that are on us all the time. We don't feel our shirts or our pants or our socks. We don't feel our ring, but if I call your attention to it, then you do feel it. We don't typically respond to a refrigerator humming, and yet if it's novel, then you will draw your attention to it. So these are examples of stimuli that we experience much of the day that we can completely suppress without really thinking about it. So in summarizing this, this first step, the counseling area, which is such an important area, remember to counsel about the different things that you're seeing on the screen. Anatomy of the auditory system, the fact that tinnitus is likely a normal consequence of the hearing loss. It's by the way, it's surprising that people with hearing loss don't have tinnitus, but it's important for the person that you're seeing to understand that it is the hearing loss that is likely triggering the tinnitus, not the other way around. Our clients have to understand that tinnitus may be permanent, however, it doesn't mean that it's going to get worse. And in fact, for the vast majority of people, the presence of tinnitus tends to fade over time because their attention is not constantly drawn to it unless fear or threat is associated with it. It's the patient's or the client's reaction to the tinnitus that is the key issue that we have to help them deal with. And the purpose in our 
professional intervention with our clients is to help them to habituate to the tinnitus and not necessarily to eliminate it or cure it as we would love to do, but we really don't have that capability at this point in time.